So I'm a CFO of a publicly traded company, okay? Never been a CFO, well actually, shouldn't say this. I did do a stint as the CFO of a government contract, so I do understand government contracting. But he brought up and said, for tribal, thing, assuming American right. Indian, right. no knowledge, zero. Don't know what, anything about it, so ask me a question and I'll just give you a blank stare, okay? So I'm just gonna be honest. So the CFO in general, the most important function, so I put up a whole bunch of stuff there, and, and one of these probably only applies to a public company, which is the fourth one down. Managing internal and external expectations of the company's historical and future performance. I could say that in a different way and call it, this is investor relations, when you manage external expectations. No government CFO really manages external expectations unless he's called before a Senate subcommittee. Then he's in a different pot of water. <laughs> but, so a lot of what I tell you today, share with you, is from both a public company perspective, mainly a public company perspective, and partially a government contractor. So the CFO can do a lot of different things depending on the size of the company. The company that I'm a CFO for is a very small publicly traded company, very small. And by all measures, it probably shouldn't be a public company, but nevertheless, it is. I have worked my career, and this is where I'll give you a little bit of my history. So I've been in corporate finance all my life. I started out at a public, I'm sorry, a public hospital in New York City, <coughs> Bellevue Hospital Center. You probably all heard of Bellevue. One of the largest public hospitals in America. It's got 1,400 beds. It's known because of its large psychiatric wards, it's got 400 beds. That's pretty big. I moved from Bellevue to MCI, a little telecom company that was ultimately bought by WorldCom. So I spent six years there, also in corporate finance. I left there right after the WorldCom merger. And then I went to another telecom company called Primus Telecommunications, all publicly traded companies. At Primus, I spent 12 and a half years there, did quite a bit of public and private debt and equity raises. We raised two and a half billion dollars in both the public and private debt markets. We closed 25 acquisitions. And for those of you who have any finance work at all, you know to close 25 acquisitions, you gotta look at probably 250 companies. So they say you gotta kiss a lot of frogs until you find a prince. That's the saying in the investment banking world. I left Primus in March 2011. And I joined another company that I work for now. It's called Santion Group small publicly traded software company. They're based in Reston, Virginia. I've been there for two and a half years. Yeah. I've got some exciting stories to tell you about that a little bit later on. So as I was saying before, what does the CFO do? Well, the CFO does a lot of different things. In a very, very large company, take IBM for example, the CFO will have oversight mainly over financial operations. And he'll have a dozen direct reports. One is say in charge of financial operations, one's in charge of collections, one's in charge of treasury. He'll have a whole treasury department that's enormous because they have cross-border currency risk and hedging and things like that. Sometimes when a company's really small like mine, you're a jack of all trades. You're doing everything. You're handling HR, facilities, potentially legal. You're handling finance, accounting, and the worst part about it, SEC compliance, okay? I'm gonna tell you, I am not a big fan of the SEC. I think that is the Full Employment Act. So for those of you who work for the government, please accept my apologies. But here's the worst part about being a CFO. Oh my God, the buck always stops with the CFO. So one of the things that really bothered me a lot. So my favorite job ever is probably Primus because I consider that my coming out point. But my favorite job is MCI. Bothered me a lot when WorldCom filed for bankruptcy. And one of the controllers, because of everything that was going on, committed suicide. Bad stuff. So CFOs go to jail for bad stuff. So it's always in a moral dilemma of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and who you ultimately answer to. Because if you're the CFO, and I'm the CEO, and I don't know your name, your name, Jeremy. Jeremy. Say, Jeremy, how's the quarter looking? So Jeremy says, eh, a little bit up here, a little bit down there. 
It, it, Jeremy, we need it to be up everywhere. What can you do? Creative accounting? <laughs> Don't break any laws. But yeah. can't you defer stuff, capitalize stuff? Jeremy's like, I'm going to get back to you. Goes back, talks to his auditor, talks to his accountants, tries to figure things out. And then all of a sudden, Chris. Chris is our general counsel. She's the chief risk officer. You manage risk. Jeremy's the CFO, you're the general counsel. Jeremy comes to Chris and says, Chris, we gotta talk. Closes the door. Mark, I think he's asking you to manage earnings, but I'm not sure. It's a tough place to be. It's a very tough place to be, okay? So, where does the CFO fit in the organization? Obviously, he usually reports to the CEO. Sometimes, however, that's not true. Sometimes the CFO reports right to the board. If the board has a feeling that Mark is telling Jeremy to manage earnings, the audit, now, a public company, any public company, has to have two important boards. Even if you're the tiniest public company on the planet, there's two critical committees you have to have. An audit committee and a compensation committee. Everything else is nonsense. Nominating, governance, all this, nobody cares about those. The real quick key one is the audit committee. So if Jeremy is under pressure from me to manage earnings, the board will say, hey Mark, to protect you, we're gonna have Jeremy report to us directly. That's not really their intent. They don't trust me. That's what they're really saying. It took me a while to figure out how to do this. <laughs> That's why I'm a CFO, I'm not like in design. So the, the typical corporate structures, you have the CEO, direct reports or CFO. This position isn't always present. The chief operating officer, he's the guy in head, of, head of all operations and all this other good stuff. And then the general counsel, that's Chris. So here's Jeremy, here's Chris, here's Mark. So this is the normal structure you'll see. Why is the CFO so important? Is if there's no chief operating officer, generally, if there's a succession event, the CFO is usually the interim CEO until a new CEO is selected, or sometimes, for example, like in my company, Sorry, not my company. The books are kept intact, and you're the only one who knows it, really. You're the safest hand. Because, and, and here's what's interesting. So back in August, we had our first uh, investor relations non-deal roadshow. Is that term familiar to everybody? Non-deal roadshow? Okay. When public companies want to raise money, they go on a roadshow. It's exactly what it sounds like. Your investment bankers or your investor relations firm puts together a really nice presentation, call it a book, and then they take you on the road. They set up meetings ahead of time, so okay, we're gonna be with Fidelity at this time, um, Vanguard at this time, and you're in back-to-back -back meetings. It's an exhausting, it's awful. And the schedules are really rigorous. And the purpose of that is to present your company a beauty contest and you say you have to like me you have to buy into my IPO so please subscribe a non-deal road show is when you go out there and you say I just want to tell you about my company I'm not here to raise money I just want you to put my ticker on your screen so when you show up to work every morning Santiago comes up you say okay so that's a non-deal road show funny thing about people they love listening to the CEO and then after the CEO done with his pitch they always looked at me and say so how are the books I said, they're clean. One of them was actually funny. He looked at me and said, do you want me to ask the CEO to leave him so you can kind of answer more honestly? <laughs> and I said, no. I would say the same answer even if he left the room. So when you go on a non-deal road show, when you talk to the street, the street is a universal term for the entire investing community. Hedge funds, private equity, family offices, Everybody that's got money to manage.
in a smaller company, in a smaller company, you don't need to read this, in a smaller company, the CFO is involved in many, many different things. He's managing accounts payable, he's managing accounts receivable, he's reaching out to customers, he's looking at rates when the salespeople sell to a new customer, he's monitoring contracts, I'm talking about what I do every day, so when I say he, that's me. And you gotta deal with like, the office manager who is handling the leases of your space and HR and open enrollments and the Affordable Care Act and everything. But truthfully, that all is the basic blocking and tackling. The most important thing, right here, keep your internal and external stakeholders blocking. Who are your internal stakeholders? Management. The CEO. You hold the, pull, the purse strings. He wants to know, how's the company doing? How are we doing? Are we going to grow revenue quarter over quarter? What about profits? Do we have money to hire people? Do I got to scale back? So that's internal management expectations, expectations management. Then the external, the folks that have invested in your company. I get calls from investors all the time. How are you doing? Is the company doing okay? Is there anything I need to be worried about? What's the answer to that? This is a trick question. Anybody hear of Reg FD? It's an SEC regulation. It's called Regulation Fair Disclosure. It came about in 19, probably 2000. Somewhere around that, 2000, 2001. What that means is, I can't, your name's um, Matthew. I can't tell Matthew, if Matthew calls me up and he's a shareholder and says, hey, how's the company doing? I gotta say, Matthew, can't tell you a thing. That's the answer. I can't tell you a thing. Because unless I put out, if I tell you something, I have to issue a press release to the entire planet and say, this is what I told Matthew. You can't do that. That is the law of perfect information. We cannot, as a public company, disclose information to one party that the rest of the investing public has access to. Everybody has to have access, and it's sort of the, the concept of having free and equal information. That's regulation, fair disclosure. By the way, my old company, MCI, when it went bankrupt, this was the outcome of this. <laughs> Sorry, Ben's auction. Probably one of the worst. Is the CFO a friend or foe? Obviously, I'm a little bit jaded. But I'll say yes, I'm your friend. But I had an old boss one who told me, two weeks into my job at Primus, the, CE the CEO called me and said, hey, how are you doing? I said, great, just starting to uh, get to know people, figure out who the movers and shakers are. And he says, okay, hold on, slow down, slow down, slow down. You're making friends? I said, yeah. And he says, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> he says, if you make friends, you're not doing your job. I said, why is that? And he said, because then you feel you'll sympathize with them. I want you to be objective. I don't want you to be their friend. Okay. So the CFO is actually, a lot of times you'll find, and it's not just the CFO, but that's what we're talking about today. It could be any CXO. Okay. He's the sounding board for crazy ideas. He is, he's the guy that a lot of people go to and say, hey, I realize you're spending way too much on coffee. And I got a great idea. Hand out Starbucks gift cards. But he's also somebody that, he's an advocate and a potential objective party. Because the CFO has to be the steady hand. The guy who looks at a project and, this gentleman here, tell me your name. Andy. Andy. Andy's chief technology officer. He's the guy that wants to invest in cloud computing and he wants to move all of our servers up into the, the cloud and that's the right thing to do. And, he convinces me, and I say, Andy, that's a great idea. I think I like where you're going. 
It reduces operations and maintenance. Don't have to buy as much hardware. We put the onus on Amazon. Let them handle it. Great idea. 18 months later, I say, hey, Andy, let's do a post-mortem. How'd that work out? And all of a sudden, Andy starts to get agitated. Well, you know, took a little longer than we expected. Hit a couple of bumps in the road. A couple of, you know, I don't know. Andy, how are we doing? I need five million more. <laughs> Andy, what's your assessment? You know, if we could have done this differently, we could have done that, that would have been much better. Okay, so is it safe to say, Andy, that this was pretty close to a failure? Well, I wouldn't say that. You know, failure is a very harsh and stark term. You know, it's kind of like final. And I'd say, look, let's call it a spade. Call a spade a spade. So that's where he tells you how you're doing. He tells you where the company, and he does a post-mortem on your projects, and he makes you feel like crap. Because he himself has to then turn around and tell the board, the executive team, and the external stakeholders, yeah, remember that big cost-saving project we talked about two quarters ago that we're moving everything out into the cloud and we're going to save X million dollars per year in IT expenses? That's going to be a little delayed. It's not off track. So then all of a sudden you get into spin doctor. So now you know why the CFO is such a tough person to deal with. Because Andy has his own little world to deal with, but the CFO is dealing with internal and external stakeholders that aren't as forgiving. Because Matthew is my shareholder, Matthew's gonna ride me hard. And he should. So I've recently been in the role of a CFO. Now let me, before I go to investor relations, because this is all tied together. So there's sort of three presentations I rolled into one today. Investor relations, the role of the CFO, investor relations, and then the last one, which I'll touch on very, very briefly. I'm gonna breeze through it because I don't think it's the focus of this session today, which is capital raising. Okay? Investor relations is a very important function. It is the most thankless function in a public company. It really is. And, I, and what falls, I'm gonna use a general term, and I know it's, it's not exactly correct, but just allow me this today. Public relations, corporate communications, sort of fall under the concept of investor relations. Not exactly, and some of them probably would squirm in their seats if they heard me saying that, but it sort of does. And this is a very important thing. So, investor relations can act as the ambassador of the company. The function of an investor relations officer is to be the ambassador of the company to basically go out. Remember I was talking about those non-deal roadshows? The investor relations person, if a company has one, is the one who organizes that, if a company can afford to have one. We don't have one. I am IR. So I'm the one dealing with our investor relations external uh, company. We have a firm in New York City that does that for us. I work with them. So their basic function is just like the ambassador of the U.S. to say England. He lets England know what the U.S. feels about certain things. And for example, if David Cameron's unhappy with the U.S., who does he call to his office right away? The U.S. ambassador. He says, come here, I want to talk to you. I have a bone to pick. I'm going to go through these quickly. Your job is to bring awareness of the company's value and attractiveness to the investing public. Because if you think about it, using Matthew again as a, as a high net worth individual, who has money to spend, but not unlimited money. So basically, Ben is the CFO of another public company. So he and I are in competition for your money. So we both, he's got you at 10 a.m., you've got me at 10.30. And our objective is to convince you why you should invest with our individual companies as opposed to the other. And why the intrinsic value, there's greater potential value because you're, a law, you're sort of a, a buy and hold type investor. You're not in and out in three days. 
but you're also the corporate communication source. So just like, is it Jay Farnham? White House press secretary? That's the name, Jay Farnham, right? He's always out there. That's the worst job on the planet. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know why anybody would take that job. He's the guy out there saying, okay, I know it looks really bad, but it really isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's an awful, awful job. But that's why IR, and this is the sad thing about IR, when a company falls on hard times, public companies, sometimes the first job to be cut is the IR person, which actually is stupid. It should be the last job you cut. But ultimately, your success in the job is how well the world knows who you are and how much volume trading is going on in your stock. That's gonna get annoying. Okay, I think we talked about this. This is just the, the, the world of investments, external stakeholders. This is my favorite. Rating agencies. You guys familiar with Moody's? Fitch, Standard & Poor's. So I'm not with my current company, but with Primus, I had the good fortune to go to S&P quite a few times. And they've got wonderful offices in downtown Manhattan. Really, really nice. I mean, you walk in and you get up like on the 26th floor of this beautiful building. It's all mahogany, huge wide hallway mahogany. And it's probably 50 conference rooms on each side. And each one has got the most lavish furniture. And they lay out the best food. <laughs> and you go there and you pitch your company. And you, you spend, they give you two to three hours. And there's always a small talk in the beginning. Oh, yeah, where'd you go skiing? Oh, my kid goes to that college too. And that's, okay, so tell us about your company. And then they lay into you. You guys going to make it? You guys look like you're on the rocks. Um, I think we're okay. And then they put out this really nasty report about how bad your company is. <laughs> and you paid $45,000 for that. <laughs> you have to write a check before you show up. Because after you get the report, you're going to write that check? Absolutely not. <laughs> so you write that check before you show up to New York. So they're supposed to be leading indicators of how a company's doing. You heard it here first. They are lagging indicators. Honestly. And now, so they're trying to swing the pendulum to the other side. So now they put out these reports that are premature about, yeah, we think we're going to downgrade the US yet one more time. Wow. OK. We're going to help the economy. So not a big fan. Not a big fan. But they have their value. OK, so I know I'm being really negative about them, but they have their value. So what's the process of IR? I talked a lot about this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But investor relations is the same exact thing as marketing. So if you have a, if anybody in this room has a marketing bent, IR is the same thing. You have a plan, you have an audience, you have a product to sell, and you have a strategy to get that product to market. And it's not just doing it once. It's going out multiple times. So after you tell them, you go back and tell them again. And before you're done, you tell them what you told them to remind them. So you tell them again. And that's what you, it's a marketing strategy. So you go on non-deal roadshows, you develop an elevator pitch so that anybody you're talking to, and you're going to all these conferences, you're having lots of boring breakfasts with people you don't like. And you go, so these conferences, so I, I presented at a conference back in May. It's actually, it's, it's like a huge uh, trade conference. And everybody's walking around, they're giving you all these tchotchkes that you don't want. And your bag, your bag is heavy with all this junk. And as you're walking by, no kidding, people are like throwing stuff in your bag. And you're like, no, I don't want that. <laughs> I, don't, another, I don't need another stress toy, OK? <laughs> so, but that's what IR is, is that you're you're constantly marketing your company. And it's extremely important. Now, I didn't, 
I didn't really get a sense of what the, uh, the background of this class is. But is there anybody that's in marketing at all or any kind of public relations, corporate communications, or anything like that? You are. Okay. That's why you've been scowling ever since I started this section. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is, I mean, if you think about it, sometimes the toughest job of investor relations is putting lipstick on the pig. You're taking a tough situation and trying to paint it in a positive light. But it's, it's not always that simple. So we talked some about this. Yeah. Last point I want to talk about. You know who's in your stock. This is a big deal. Just like any marketing person knows who's buying your product. Because let's take one of my favorite companies on the planet, Starbucks. I am a coffee drinker. I love Starbucks coffee. And if I could buy one of those, I wish they franchise. <laughs> I'd be the first person in line. Why is Starbucks so successful? Seems like a stupid question but it's really not. Why is Starbucks successful? That's a real question. <laughs> Any answers? Marketing. You think that's it? Branding, marketing? That's like the 100,000 foot level answer. Come on, think about it. Why are they so successful? Pizza, pizza, coffee. Consistency. Consistency? Easy access on every street corner. Okay, they're, they're, they're everywhere, okay. You drink coffee. Why are they so successful? Why do you go there and not Pete's Caribou Coffee, or Seattle's Best? They're great rewards, sir. <laughs> I have one, love it. It's on my phone, I get free coffee every once in a while. And my kids got a hold of it and they figured out, hey, wait a minute, I can charge the dad's account. This is great. Why don't you give me an answer? Well, they've created an image. Um, I mean, th th their, their um, customers like the experience. They like what they get. It's a reasonable price. Um, they've changed the way people perceive coffee. It's, just, it's, it's an experience. It's just not, you know, a, a, a cup of coffee. They're the ones that brought it over from uh, overseas. Is sort of um, some of the thoughts that I have. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Outstanding. They have changed the experience of drinking coffee. So I grew up in New York City. I remember, I'm old enough to remember, that I would buy a cup of coffee, probably a little smaller than this, probably the 10 or 12 ounce, for a buck. And it was simple. On the way to the subway to work in the morning, you stopped in the neighborhood deli, gave the guy a buck, he gave you a coffee. And he put the creamer, he put the sugar, never right, but you dealt with it. And you marched on your way to the subway. Coffee shouldn't be more than a buck. Why do I, and you now, pay two forty-five dollars for a venti bowl? Does that make any sense? It doesn't. Why do you pay why do my kids pay five bucks for those venti caramel macchiatos with a double pump? <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone stopped to think about that? We have, but we're okay with it. Because, to your point, they've changed the concept. They have changed the mindset. I love, love, love the way you said that. That is the essence of it. And that's where the brilliance of investor relations and marketing is. You know what the other, another stroke of marketing brilliance is when Target said, we're Target. Marketing brilliance. If that person wasn't made a millionaire on the spot who came up with that idea, they should be. 
They should have been elevated to the title of chief marketing officer. Because now all of a sudden, it's not passe to go into Target. <laughs> So you know who's buying your product, and you change their mindset. Poor college kids have no business in a Starbucks, yet they are the ones. My daughter goes to James Madison University. The Starbucks that is right across the street from campus has a light out the door 24 hours a day. Where are they getting the money? No, they've convinced their parents they need a car. You want me to study, don't you? I need money. And that stuff that they put in the cafeteria should not be given to the dogs. <laughs> Don't you love your daughter? <laughs> this is just a couple of ideas of how you measure the success of an investor relations program. Is that you don't want yourself to be too heavily skewed to one side or the other. You don't want too much institutional ownership because institutional owners don't buy and sell frequently. They buy and hold. Like if CalPERS, the huge California pension plan, owns your stock, they're not buying and selling a lot. They buy and hold. So if you have too much institutional ownership, there's no what they call volatility or volume in your stock. Volatility is not the right word, sorry. There's no volume in the trading of your stock. So you want some stable institution, you want and outsiders, like Matthew, the investor, he wants to know that I own stock in the company. By the way, here's a little bit of a side, uh, <laughs> you probably know this, but if the CFO starts selling the stock, you better get out quick. <laughs> <laughs> so you want a public float. There should be an adequate public float in the stock. That means if Ben wants to buy a stock and he can't get a hold of it, what's the use of it? Or if he buys and he can't get out, that's an illiquid stock. Yeah, this is wishful thinking. Yeah, these are the people you really hate to pander to. The, what they call the sell side analysts, equity analysts, right? So they are sell side people, and they're the ones that you have to really whine and dine to get them to like you and to write these nice things about you, and they go sell it to their investors because that's how they make money. But if you have a poor quarter, they hate you and they never sell it again, and but this goes back to, believe it or not, the IR person has a very, very important role in controlling the stock's level of volume. If you're not putting out a steady stream of news, good news, information, where Ben feels like he knows how my company's doing, if he doesn't know, he's not gonna buy. He's like, there's not enough news coming out of there and I can't wait every 90 days to hear how the earnings are going. That's just not enough for me. It's a thankless job. But we are going to go, I am going to, I've talked about some of this stuff. And the reason I'm rushing through this, folks, is not because I don't think this is important, it really is, is because I really want to get to the next presentation, not this one, um, which is mergers and acquisitions. That's my real passion. So let's talk about raising capital. First question, why do you raise capital? Did I give you all the answers again? Let me take it back. Why do you raise capital? <laughs> Grow the business. What else? Why do you borrow money? Enhance, diversify your products. Okay. You want to launch a new product. Really? You want to buy something like a plant? You want to buy a big piece of machinery? How about you want to buy another company? You want to buy something. Sometimes, this was actually interesting. There was a company out there. Yes? What did Verizon recently do? I know this because I'm a big telecom guy. What did Verizon recently do? Quite amazing. They recently raised $49 billion in debt to buy out their partner, Vodafone. So Vodafone is this huge British firm, one of the biggest international telecom companies on the planet. So Vodafone owned, you probably didn't know this, 45% of Verizon Wireless. Did you know that? Yeah. So I know that because I'm just a dork. But, so Vodafone 
I mean, think about it. And they were a silent partner of 45%. Imagine you own 45% of Verizon Wireless. Imagine the checks you get in the mail every month. So, you know how much Verizon bought Vodafone out for? You sound like you're nodding your head like you know. I don't know. They paid a hundred, I think it's a hundred and forty-five billion to buy them out. So wait a minute, they only raised forty-nine billion. Where did they get the rest of the money? They issued some other stuff, but they had a ton of cash on their balance sheet. So they raised debt to buy out their partner. There was another company who didn't have any debt at all. Apple had no debt. So all their bankers were saying, okay, there is this, there is this complex financial theory. Okay? And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it, it, mathematically it does. When you run through the, the computations, it really does make sense. There's this theory of an optimum level of debt. Right? Ed's nodding his head, he knows that. It's actually from a corporate perspective, if you run through the math, because interest expense on debt is tax deductible, there is an optimal level of debt that any company should have. And it's different for every company, depending on your financial structure, your earnings, and things like that. So you should have debt. Meanwhile, your mom told you, never go into debt. So we pay off our credit cards at debt every month, like good citizens. So we raised debt to expand our operations, to buy something big, to make an acquisition, to refinance existing debt, maybe to take out an early stage investor. Then we talked about some other ideas. But where do you find it? You can go to your friends and family. And that's actually a big thing for small companies. If you're a small business and you, like let's say Chris starts a, Chris wants to be a florist. It's hard for her to go to a bank and say, I got a great idea. The bank's like, florist? Is that what the world needs, another florist? <laughs> so she has to go to friends and family. And then each one writes a $5,000 check, and then you start your business. There's a lot of companies out there, like Xerox, that give you a copy or say, oh, no money down. We'll just give it to you. Pay $250 a month. That's vendor financing. Very easy to get. Does anybody have a loan on their car? I do. That's vendor financing. Simple. Another form of vendor financing? You got a house? It's a mortgage. That's vendor financing. Some of these other things, private equity funds, public capital markets, like this is what I did at, at Primus. We raised two and a half billion dollars. So when you go to the markets, you go on these road shows and people sign up. And this is actually interesting. So I'll tell you a little bit about one of my stories. One of the things I thought was the most amazing events of capital raising ever. So what I'm about to say, you gotta take with a grain of salt. So actually, one of my favorite investment banks that I dealt with, Lehman Brothers. I know, see, everybody just, oh. I'll tell you what. Forget about Dick Fold, the CEO of Lehman. He was, he was a turd. I don't like him. He's the reason they went under. But their folks, their bankers, smartest group of guys you ever met. I mean, so sharp. And they're not the only smart guys out there, but we liked them a lot. So we went to them once, and we wanted to raise money. So we identified the amount. We wanted to raise $100 million. So they said, great, no problem. So we went out, we prepared a presentation. We got a bunch of folks to sign non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements. We had a presentation at 5 o'clock. We had a conference call. Lehman was running the show. We gave the presentation. The next morning, $100 million was in our bank. That's what they call an overnight raise. Amazing. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? A hundred million dollars overnight. God, I'd love to be able to borrow money that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, and that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. That happens quite a bit. The hardest form of financing to get is your friendly neighborhood bank. They are the worst. Awful. When you're a company. So back to me, the CFO. What's the role of a CFO in capital raising? He runs the process. He is the man. Why? Because 
He's the person the lenders look to if something goes south. He has to be in control of the process. This is something that most people don't know. And this is why a lot of big companies raise money. When should you raise money? When you don't need it. Why? What's the contrary to that? That's right, what Ed said. When you need the money, you cannot get it. Trust me, lenders smell blood a mile away. The moment you walk in, hat in hand, and you want to raise money? Sure. The interest rate starts at 20%. You're negotiating at 20%. And it could go up. Raise money when you don't need it. When your financials are the strongest, when you're paying your bills right on time and you can save money, go get financing. Put that in your back pocket and say, I'm gonna need this one day, I don't know when, but I will. And, when, and also, that's when you can dictate terms. Why did this make sense? Because Pixar, this goes to your point and your point, Pixar had a wonderful product. Disney had a wonderful distribution channel. I will take your beautiful product, push it through my distribution channel, we're gonna make great music together. And sure enough, they did. People always poo-poo this and they say, huh, did you pay too much? Seven billion dollars? Let me tell you something. Nobody's ever gonna know the right answer to that question, but they didn't. This was the most perfect thing ever. Now the bad. It's not the ugly, but the bad. So, this is a few bad things, okay? This one's actually pretty funny. HP Autonomy. So Autonomy is a software company and apparently there's some alleged accounting misstatements by autonomy during the due diligence process, so they took a $9 billion write down. Wow, that's tough to explain if you're the CFO, huh? So, let you guys take a look at this. Daimler Benz Chrysler, bad deal. Hmm. This is a good example. Daimler Benz wanted to expand into the US market. Chrysler was a great company, as a matter of fact, when Chrysler was purchased by Daimler-Benz, Chrysler was a very profitable company. They weren't the company of the, of the 70s, of Lee Iacocca in the 80s, where they had to be saved. No. This was a thriving company, and their vice chairman, this guy, Richard Lutz, or Dick Lutz, something, one of the most brilliant car designers, still working today, he's the one who transformed Chrysler. So they were a great company. Daimler-Benz says, good company, we're Germans, we know how to do things the right way. We're gonna buy it. So Daimler Benz said we need to expand to the US. They even had they wanted to get bigger, that's what I should say. They were already here. So did you see? They were doing well in the mid-90s, most profitable car company, eight billion dollars of cash on hand. That's a good good acquisition for here, right? Looks good. The Germans said we can teach. A struggling company, how to do things the German way, right? So they paid $37 billion. So the CEO of Daimler said, it's a merger of equals. Well, the problem, this is a good example I alluded to before of how culture is so important. I'm sorry. I've owned a Mercedes myself, so I'm not poo-pooing this. But uh, folks in different countries don't always play together nicely. And this was a good example. The Germans saw themselves as a highbrow, you know, we appeal to the, you know, the elite car market buyers. Whereas the Chryslers, they're the blue collar guys. And they couldn't integrate any of their platforms. This was the, the, the killer. Jürgen Schrem said, 
The merger of equals statement was necessary in order to earn support of Chrysler's workers, but it was never a reality. Read that as, we lied. Just kidding. How hard is that? You pay $37 billion and you sell it to a private equity group, Cerberus, for $6 billion. Hmm, tough. Very, very tough. I found this good quote. I think it makes a lot of sense. Mega acquisitions tend to destroy value because you tend to overpay. And now let's talk about the really ugly one. Probably the worst merger in corporate history. The, va the deal was valued at $182 billion, and they believed, Steve Case from AOL believed that the combined companies would be worth 350 dollars AOL paid Time Warner twice its market cap. That means if your stock's selling at 10, I'll give you 20. Big, big company. Now, again, this is at the time when money was cheap. Money was basically free. So, the new company, this is some of the specifics, but the deal was described as transformative because AOL was like the internet king of dialogue. Dialogue. <laughs> the market was already moving to broadband. They saw Time Warner as the media distribution outlet so that when you opened up your website, it says, you got mail. And you went onto the AOL website, you'd see like, oh, you could buy, look at movies, you could do things. A nice idea. Did you ever watch a movie on Dialogue. Mm -hmm. So the Time Warner CEO, Gerald Levin, became the CEO of the new company, Steve Case, would become chairman, a non-executive chairman. So he basically cashed out. Made a lot of money. The shares rose the day it was announced. But there was a big culture problem. The Time Warner guys were up in New York City. AOL had a huge campus out in Ashburn, over here in Virginia, right? Like the, who's the guy that owns the, uh, the capitals? Leonsis. Leonsis. So Leonsis asks the question, saying, hold on for a second. If we bought them, why are we moving our headquarters up to New York City? Good question, right? The dot-com bubble burst. The synergies were not realized. Both sides hated each other. So Gerald Levin, the CEO of Time Warner before the merger, was a suit and tie guy every day. On the day of the merger, he shows up to the, to the press release, no tie. Shirt open. He's now an internet guy. The Time Warner guys didn't like it. So ultimately, he was outed. Dick Parsons from, AO, from Time Warner took over. He unwound the deal. He says, you all suck. We're, we're severing this. And Time Warner was visibly in charge. Remember, the headquarters moved to New York City at Rockefeller Center. The SEC investigates past accounting practices of AOL, not Time Warner. It resulted in heavy fines and a restatement. The worst thing a CFO has to go through is a, a financial statement, a financial statement restatement. That is basically you writing your own pink slip. You're like, this happened on my watch, it's my mistake. I will comply with it. Now you know why CEO, CFOs are already pissed off. Steve Case stepped down. The two companies are separated. The combined value of the two separate companies is now 20% of the acquisition value. Off, off, off. Ted Turner from Turner Broadcasting was a big shareholder of Time Warner. He personally lost a small chunk of change. Excellent, I'm done. Thank you. So, how, how come this didn't work? So how do you stop yourself from being acquired? This is actually interesting. How do you fend off the corporate raider? You know what a poison pill is? You know what a poison pill is. Everybody else know what a poison pill is? Poison pill is something that a company will write into its bylaws. It has to be written into the bylaws in order to take effect. So let's say Carl Icahn knocks on your door and says, I like what you're doing, I'm gonna buy up your shares. And I'm gonna I'm gonna own about 75%. You go to your board quickly, you start running, you run to your board, Emergency meeting, we gotta figure this out. Board 
evaluates its options, does a lot of research, they said, we're going to exercise the poison pill. What you basically do is you issue an unlimited number of shares, so it becomes too expensive for that shareholder to buy. It's a poison pill. But it's bad for the company, too. So sometimes what you do is you sell the golden goose. Maybe that, that activist shareholder wants a particular pot. You say, okay, fine. Is it this line of business that you really care about? Fine, take it. And you charge them an exorbitant amount of money. Or you go to someone else. You say, I don't, me, MCI, I don't want to buy, I don't like Bernie Evers, I don't want to be sold to WorldCom. I will sell myself to this other telecom company, uh, AT&T. So you go to AT&T and you court them. Or you send an open letter to your shareholders and you put it in the Wall Street Journal and say, don't listen to Carl Icahn. He is bad for the company. You go to the regulators and say, please protect me. Or you tell them, say, okay, fine. If you're going to buy this business, we're all going to walk. And this company's going to fall flat on its face in two months. You find problems with the deal. You could insist on huge breakup fees. Actually, uh, Sprint actually benefited from this recently. Sprint was going to buy somebody, I can't remember who it was, and AT&T came in at the last second and bought the company, and they had to pay Sprint $450 million as a breakup fee. So, interesting thing to have like that. I'm done. I, I went through that a lot more quickly than I would have liked, but I can see some sleepy eyes in here and I don't blame you. Mark, I do want you to spend a little bit of time talking about how to get along with the CFO, but in terms of them as managers or executives. Oh, okay. That's a good point. How do you get along with the CFO? The first thing is, you have to understand how the CFO thinks. What are his objectives? What are her objectives? Okay. What do they care about? Number one, they care about the fundamentals. Do you understand the deal that you're proposing? Have you done your diligence? Do you understand the numbers? Have you done any scenarios? Like what if it's 5% worse, 5% better, 15% worse or better? You've got to understand how they think. Okay? Don't walk in, if you're like Andy, you know, chief technology officer, and say, he understands technology speak. No, he may not. He may assume he doesn't. Break it down for him. Talk the language that he talks. And then, own it. There's nothing a CFO hates more for someone to pitch a deal and run away from it quickly, like Andy did when the servers couldn't move to Amazon in the time frame expected. Own the deal. Very, very important. If you don't take ownership, the next time you come calling, I think the CFO remembers, he's going to say, I don't care if you've got the cure to cancer, I'm not buying because you don't own it. Because it ultimately falls back on him. See if the CEO will go to the CFO and say, hmm. So Ed came to you with this harebrained idea. You stood behind it. Ed is now off working at Starbucks. You own his deal. What are you gonna do about it? I don't want that responsibility. So understand what the, CEO, the CFO, how the CFO thinks. Speak his language. Own the deal. And then also, and th this is where a CFO, you could actually kind of stroke them a bit. Bounce ideas off. Say, hey, I want to get your opinion on something. I really value your opinion. We like that. <laughs> so there's nothing a CFO, me particularly, hates more than to find out a key strategic decision was discussed and I wasn't part of it especially if there's a financial impact. Because then I turn into like an official jerk. Say, so guess what? I'm not behind this. Full stop on everything until I understand it. Bring them in. Say, so make the CFO your ally. And the best way you can do that is get to know them. Understand what they care about and where their hot buttons are. Because they're different for everybody. Does that give you a good perspective?
And also remember one thing about the CFO's mindset. Whether you're a public company, more so if you're a public company, there's real legal risk a CFO assumes. When he attaches his name to anything, or she signs her name on anything, they are basically saying, I'm rep to this. And I'm willing to put my like, reputation and my personal reputation at risk. It's a big deal. So if they look at you and they kind of scrunch up their eyebrows, you understand why. Any questions? I couldn't have been that thorough. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for and Brian as well for allowing me to. I'm going to ask a real question. I want real answers. Your really savvy Uncle Ted says, Andy, I like your company. I want an equity ownership right here. So if I give you $150,000, how much equity will you give me? What's your answer to Uncle Ted? Think about it. Now anybody can answer. He wants to put in equity right here. It's all multiplied by your your whack is how much of debt is in your This is your weighted average cost of capital.
Okay, so my objective, I need someone to...